Imagine standing at the edge of what was once called the Sea of Death, a place so hostile that nothing could survive, a desert so vast that it could swallow entire cities without a trace. But today, something impossible is happening here. Green forests are rising from golden sand, rivers are flowing where there was only dust, and the world is watching in absolute disbelief. This is the story of how China declared war on 337,000 square kilometers of lifeless desert and won. How they moved billions of tons of sand, planted hundreds of millions of trees, and turned one of Earth's most brutal landscapes into a living, breathing ecosystem. What you're about to discover will challenge everything you thought you knew about what humans can achieve. This is not just about planting trees. This is about rewriting the rules of nature itself. For over a thousand years, northern China lived under siege by an enemy you cannot fight with weapons. Sand. Every spring, when the monsoon winds awakened, massive walls of dust would rise from the Taklamakan and Gobi deserts, traveling thousands of kilometers to blanket entire cities in darkness. Beijing, one of the world's great capitals, would disappear under clouds of fine particles, so thick that day turned into night. Streetlights flickered on at noon. Cars crashed into each other in the blinding haze. Children wore masks just to walk to school. By the 1990s, residents in northern China were living through more than 80 days each year of choking dust storms. The air tasted like metal. Every surface was covered in a layer of grit that no amount of cleaning could remove. People sealed their windows with tape, but the dust found its way inside anyway, coating furniture, food, and lungs with microscopic particles of the desert. But the visible destruction was only the beginning. Beneath those dust clouds, something far more terrifying was happening. The desert was growing. Every single year, desertification was consuming an additional 2,460 square kilometers of land. That is equivalent to losing an area the size of Luxembourg annually. Farmland that had fed families for generations turned to dust overnight. Villages that had stood for centuries were abandoned as sand dunes swallowed homes, schools, and temples. Wells that had provided water for decades suddenly ran dry as groundwater levels plummeted. Entire communities became environmental refugees, forced to flee as the desert advanced like a slow-motion tsunami of sand. The Taklamakan Desert itself was born from geographical cruelty millions of years ago. The Tian Shan Mountains to the north and the Kunlun Mountains to the south created a perfect trap, blocking nearly all moisture from the Indian Ocean and Siberia. The basin between them became a furnace of extremes. Annual rainfall here measures less than 100 millimeters, nearly 10 times lower than in California, a region already famous for drought. To put this in perspective that most people can grasp, every square meter of land receives only about as much water as a single 500 milliliter water bottle per week. No plant, no animal, no human settlement could survive on so little. Summer temperatures regularly soar above 47 degrees Celsius, hot enough to cook an egg on a rock. Winter nights plunge below minus 20 degrees Celsius, and sandstorms strike without warning, with winds powerful enough to strip paint from vehicles and skin from exposed flesh. In 1978, facing ecological collapse that threatened the survival of millions of people, the Chinese government made a decision that seemed completely insane to outside observers. Instead of retreating from the desert, they would attack it. They launched the Three North Shelter Forest Program, which the world would come to know as the Green Great Wall. The name alone captured the audacity of the vision, just as the ancient Great Wall had protected China from invaders from the north. This new wall would protect against the invasion of sand. But this wall would not be built from stone or brick. It would be built from life itself. The scope of the project defied comprehension. The plan called for creating a forest barrier, 
stretching 4,500 kilometers across northern China, from Xinjiang in the west all the way to Heilongjiang in the east. This is roughly equivalent to the distance from New York to London. The timeline was equally audacious. The project was designed to run for 73 years, from 1978 to 2050, making it longer than most human lifespans. The goal was to plant 35 million hectares of new forest, transforming China's forest coverage from a mere 10% in 1949 to over 25%. To understand the scale, 35 million hectares is larger than the entire country of Germany. International experts were skeptical. Many called it impossible. Some called it foolish. They pointed out that China was attempting something no nation in history had ever achieved. Fighting desertification on this scale, in such extreme conditions, with technology that barely existed. But China had something that skeptics did not account for. Determination born from desperation. The government committed billions of dollars to the project. They mobilized the military, universities, research institutes, and millions of ordinary citizens. Scientists from around the world were invited to contribute expertise. Satellite technology was deployed to map every dune and track every shift in the sand. This was not just an environmental project. It was a declaration that humanity would not surrender to the desert. That ingenuity, persistence, and coordinated effort could achieve what nature had deemed impossible. The first major challenge was simple but brutal. How do you plan anything when the ground beneath your feet is constantly moving? Sand dunes shift and flow like slow-motion water, pushed by relentless winds. Any attempt to plant directly into moving sand would fail within days. The solution came from an unexpected source. Ancient farming techniques combined with modern engineering to create what became known as straw checkerboards. From satellite images, the implementation looks almost artistic. Millions of square meters of desert transformed into geometric patterns of golden grids, each square measuring roughly one meter by one meter. But the reality on the ground was far from artistic. It was backbreaking dangerous, and required moving millions of tons of material into one of the most hostile environments on Earth. First came the logistics nightmare. Straw had to be transported hundreds of kilometers into the deep desert, where there were no paved roads, no infrastructure, and no shelter from the elements. Trucks would sink into soft sand, requiring teams of workers to dig them out by hand. Supply convoys could take weeks to reach their destinations. Once the straw arrived, the real work began. Teams of workers, often laboring in temperatures exceeding 45 degrees Celsius, would dig shallow trenches in precise grid patterns across the dunes. Each trench had to be exactly the right depth and orientation, calculated based on wind direction and sand flow patterns. Then bundles of straw, each weighing several kilograms, were placed into these trenches and secured. The straw had to be pressed firmly into the sand, deep enough to stay in place during storms, but not so deep that it would decompose too quickly. Workers toiled under the merciless desert sun with little water, no shade, and sand constantly whipping into their faces. Many suffered from heat stroke and exhaustion, yet they continued knowing what was at stake. Each straw grid they laid played a vital role. It blocked wind to stabilize the dunes, trapped precious moisture from dew, and rare rains disrupted the sand's movement. And as it decomposed, enriched the barren soil with organic matter. Once the grids were complete, planting began, teams drilled precise holes, 30 to 50 centimeters deep, to reach the hidden moisture layer below. Into these holes went resilient species, Saxol desert poplar and red willow plants evolved to survive. Scorching heat, shifting sands, and salinity grown in nurseries. For months, each seedling was timed and planted with precision, giving the desert its first real chance at life. Trees cannot survive on less water than a bottle per week. The breakthrough came from turning the desert's greatest enemy into its ally. The Taklamakan receives over 2,700 hours of annual sunlight 
among Earth's highest. Chinese engineers captured this energy to create what the desert lacked, water. Along the 522-kilometer Tarim Desert Highway, 86 solar-powered pumping stations were installed. Photovoltaic panels generate electricity-powering pumps that draw groundwater from depths exceeding 100 meters. Underground pipelines feed drip irrigation systems, delivering water directly to tree roots. Over 200,000 trees now thrive where almost no rain falls. This created the world's first carbon-neutral desert highway. Solar panels generate clean electricity, powering water pumps without fossil fuels. The water sustains forests absorbing carbon dioxide. Engineers elevated solar panels two to three meters high, creating shade where plants like licorice and red willow grow beneath, cooling the panels and improving efficiency. How do you build roads where the ground constantly moves? The Tarim Desert Highway aimed to cut 436 kilometers straight through active desert. Construction began in 1993 under brutal conditions. Temperatures exceeding 50 degrees Celsius, sudden sandstorms, and constantly shifting ground. Engineers created a complex foundation, compacted gravel for stability, straw mats for flexibility, geotextile fabrics preventing sand migration, then specially formulated asphalt remaining flexible from minus 20 to plus 60 degrees Celsius. Straw checkerboard barriers hundreds of meters wide protect both sides. Completed in just over two years, opening October 1995. Today, this highway serves as an artery for the entire greening project. Travelers describe it as surreal, plunging into towering dunes with nothing but sand for hours. Yet the road remains perfectly smooth, then gradually green reappears, until emerging into another oasis. After four decades, results exceeded all projections. Over 30 million hectares have been reclaimed, larger than Italy. Forest coverage increased from 10% in 1949 to over 25% today. Aksu and Karame, once endless sand, now feature vast forests visible from space. The impact is dramatic. Major sandstorms declined 82% since the 1980s. Beijing's dusty days dropped from over 80 annually to occasional light events. The forests absorb over 20 million tons of CO2 yearly, equivalent to removing 4 million cars. Local climates shift with higher humidity and more rainfall creating positive feedback loops. Economic transformation followed. Former wastelands became productive zones. Millions escaped poverty. Desert edges became ecotourism destinations, generating hundreds of millions annually. Not everyone views this without concern. Much reforestation relied on monoculture planting, particularly poplars and willows. In the early 2000s, Fungal disease killed over 1 billion poplars across multiple provinces. Entire forests died within one season because the ecosystem lacked diversity. The water question looms larger. These trees need substantial water. In regions receiving under 100 millimeters annual rainfall, they survive only through irrigation or depleting groundwater. Studies show groundwater tables falling significantly. Wells run dry. Ancient oases suffer stress. Hydrologists warn China may be creating green deserts, forests existing only through constant human intervention that could collapse if support withdraws. In some regions, desertification continues advancing. Reasons include poorly suited species, insufficient care, continued overgrazing, and excessive groundwater extraction. Critics argue the program focused too heavily on impressive numbers rather than genuinely resilient ecosystems. Recognition of these challenges sparked evolution. The strategy is shifting toward comprehensive ecosystem restoration, replacing monocultures with mixed woodlands, combining native desert trees, shrubs, and grasses. New pilot projects plant native saxol, tamarisk, and sea buckthorn alongside introduced species. These native plants evolved for extreme desert conditions with minimal water. They grow slower, but prove far more resilient. 
requiring no irrigation once established. Mixed forests resist disease better, provide diverse habitats, and create complex ecosystems with standing climate variability. Growing emphasis on working with local communities integrates traditional knowledge with modern science, creating greater investment in long-term maintenance. China's war against the desert demonstrates that humans can reverse extreme environmental degradation. Transforming millions of hectares seemed impossible 50 years ago. Yet it's real, visible from space, tangible proof that environmental destruction isn't inevitable. But challenges teach equally important lessons. True success means creating self-sustaining ecosystems, respecting natural limits. The evolution reflects maturing understanding of working with nature rather than dominating it. As climate change accelerates and desertification threatens communities worldwide, the world watches. Will forests thrive, collapse under stress, or evolve into unexpected ecosystems blending human engineering with natural resilience? Standing at the Taklamakan's edge, you see both triumph and uncertainty. Green forests rising from golden sand, powered by reflected sunlight and deep-reaching roots. It's beautiful, inspiring, and teaching us the greatest challenge isn't whether we can change nature, it's whether we can do so wisely.